Moving along now, uh, so uh, our next presenter is Alice Hanlon. She'll be presenting her work on marginalized communities and environmental disasters, how the deaf community in Flint, Michigan was affected by the Flint water crisis. Um, her thesis advisor is Natasha Abner of uh, LSA Linguistics Program, and uh, her reader is uh, Melissa Bartlett of School for Environment and Sustainability. And so Alice, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. <laughs> so um, as Shelly said, my thesis is on uh, environmental disasters and marginalized groups and so I focused on the deaf community and the Flint water crisis. <clears throat> and huge thanks to Natasha Abner, Dr. Abner, and Dr. Bartlett for helping me out. Um, Dr. Abner has really done a lot for me, and I really appreciate it. So my question is, how are marginalized groups affected by environmental and natural disasters? Um, and I'm starting just with a definition of environmental justice, because that is a lens that I looked through when talking about the Flint water crisis. Um, and so I, this is the definition of environmental justice. And then a brief history of the Flint water crisis. Um, so it has been ongoing since uh, April, 2014. It was, uh, the water crisis was caused by a switch to the Flint River that was made by the emergency manager at Kurtz and it was done in an effort to save the um, city money. Um, but the necessary corrosion tests were never done and so the pipes um, ended up corroding into the water and there was a lot of lead poisoning as well as a spike in uh, Legionnaires disease. And so there were 9,000 children exposed and the um, lead poisoning effects are lifelong. They're irreversible. The only treatment for lead poisoning is taking someone out of the area where they're exposed to lead, uh, which is quite impossible if you do not have money and time to move out of a city. Um, and the residents were doubted by government officials. This was a huge part of the Flint water crisis. Residents quickly noticed the change in water. Um, they noticed the discolored water, it smelled bad and it tasted bad, as well as all of the physical um, things they experienced, like the rashes and the hair loss. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, okay, sorry guys. <laughs> My computer is lagging. Um, and they switched back to the Detroit water system in October of 2015. Uh, the residents were still being exposed to waters because the pipes had already began corroding. Uh, so the current mayor at the time declared a state of emergency and then President Obama and government Snyder a month later, it was pretty much exactly a month later, declared a state of emergency. Um, however, it was all kind of too little too late because people had been exposed to the lead poisoned water um, and the Legionnaire's disease. And then still today, people are lacking access to clean water. Um, the history of Flint, it's a deindustrialized city. Um, they face high poverty rates, high unemployment rates, and the city is also predominantly African American. It's over 50% African American. So this is a uh, population that is very susceptible to environmental racism. And as we saw in this definition, um, they did not enjoy the degree of protection from environmental health hazards and they had no part of the decision making process because under the management of emergency managers um, they have all the power so even at one point the city wanted to change back to the Detroit water system and that was vetoed by the emergency manager at the time 
And then a little background on deaf history. Um, deaf does not equal disabled. Our society is ableist and we disable deaf people. Um, and then there's a difference between little d deaf and big d deaf. Um, and deaf with capital D is being a part of deaf community and being aware of deaf culture. Um, when you're deaf with a little d, it's just you've been diagnosed with a specific level of hearing impairment. Um, deaf education is one of the uh, sort of most pertinent ways that we oppress deaf, the deaf population. Um, for the entire history of deafness, uh, it has been not recognized as a language and sign language has been seen as this very negative thing um, and deafness has been seen as this disability. And so um, oralist methods have been relied upon very heavily and that still happens today. And that's trying to teach deaf people how to speak, um, which is very hard because English is different from ASL. So that's trying to teach someone a second language without the basis of a first and native language. And then the Michigan School for the Deaf is located in Flint, which is why I'm focusing on the deaf community in Flint. Um, there is usually a school for the deaf in every state, and that is where a deaf community will congregate because they're very tight knit communities, and that's where the one school is. It was founded in 1848. Um, it's a bilingual school, so it's ASL and English. Um, and I'm focusing on the deaf community because they're this marginalized community that's very uh, can be very disconnected from the hearing community because they speak a different language. Um, and then we also know that information disseminated by the government organizations always exceeds the average person's level of understanding. And we also know that it even further exceeds this level for deaf people because of the oppression through education. Deaf people's reading levels, reading comprehension levels are usually um, just way below average compared to the hearing counterparts. And so my question is, how is this community getting the information that it needs if they speak a different language and that's not recognized? Um, can they fully understand this language, especially when it is language regarding environmental disasters and public health crises? Um, that's very technical language. And as I said, that exceeds a uh, reading level comprehension. Um, so my question was just if they were getting the help that they needed and that they are entitled to. And so what I did is I held town hall style meetings in Flint at the Flint Public Library. Um, I got the word out using social media. I posted on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit under the Flint subreddit. And I used hashtags like Flint, hashtag Flint, deaf population, deaf community um, to try to get it out to the intended population. And then I also had the help of one of Dr. Abner's research assistants, who's actually uh, um, a deaf woman and she's from Flint. And so she really helped me a lot through the process and I can't thank her enough. Um, and so we had two town hall meetings, one on Friday evening and one on Saturday morning. Um, there were one hour sessions and I brought pizza and bagels. Um, but we did two days so as to allow more people to be able to come. And Dr. Abner attended as well as three of her research assistants, including the deaf woman who I mentioned earlier. And so we only used sign language in the room. Um, and it was so, so, so cool and humbling. It was very awesome. Uh, and so we invited deaf people to come out to the town hall meetings and talk about their experience. And these five questions that I have listed here are questions that I had to sort of jumpstart the conversation. Uh, most people have followed it pretty rigidly, but um, it was just there to guide the conversation. And I chose these questions because they asked about sources of information and personal experiences. Um, these are some demographics of, part of the people who came. Um, most participants were older middle-aged to 40 to 60 years old. Um, but we had a participant who was only 19 years old who talked about their experience. Um, the highest level of education is high school and um, the racial demographics, it was 50% African-American, which is interesting because that is very similar to Flint's demographics. Um, but as you can see in the highest level of education, it's 
a population that does not have high levels of educational attainment compared to hearing populations. To analyze the translations, we used um, Elon and really relied on the help of the deaf research assistant to ensure that everything was accurate. Um, and we're still translating a couple of things. Uh, and when analyzing it, I looked for common experiences that we heard throughout um, the people telling their experiences. And then also things that I deemed as significant, which were like particularly shocking or disturbing. Um, the results, so what we found was very common was a reliance on informal news sources. Uh, people found out about the water crisis from their friends and family, um, not really from the news or from the government. Um, we heard people talking about going to the doctor and feeling like because they were deaf, they were less likely to go to the doctor as timely as a hearing person. Uh, one participant talked ex uh, a lot about their experience volunteering during the Flint water crisis and seeing people fall ill and even die. Um, and there were several participants who talked about reliance on religion and praying for clean water because they felt that was all they could do because the government wasn't helping. Um, and a lot, of gov or a lot of participants were angry and felt belittled. So that is not uh, exclusive to the deaf community. I know that a lot of these things were also felt by the hearing community because this was a case of environmental uh, racism in which the government was lying to the uh, residents of Flint. Um, but another thing that we found in my research was that there is little to no literature or evaluations on emergency preparedness for deaf people in place. Um, even community-based organizations that serve, specifically serve deaf people, um, have little to no emergency preparedness, um, sort of emergency preparedness, just actions in place. They, we don't have effective ways to reach this community. And so I'm not done with my thesis yet. I'm not graduating till August, um, but these are the conclusions I've come to so far. Um, the confusion that the deaf community felt was definitely magnified um, due to their disability, due to the government disabling them. Um, we had no effective way to disseminate this information during this environmental disaster. Um, and it was a public health crisis. Um, the cases of lead and Legionnaire's disease led to people passing away just due to this water. Um, and because it was the scientific and health related vocabulary, there needs to be a good way for people to understand this, um, especially in American Sign Language. We don't have a great vocabulary for these scientific or um, medical terms yet. Um, a lot of it is translated just like directly from English and um, that is a different language. So there's definitely a barrier there still. Um, and I don't feel that we have enough representatives in Flint, in Flint local government, as well as state government, or even federal government. At any level of government, we don't have the people that we need to be there fighting for the rights of deaf people and just including them in conversations. That was a big conclusion that we came to when seeing the lack of literature on deaf people and how they're affected during um, environmental and public health disasters or health crises. Um, there is no one including them in these conversations. Um, and that is all I have. Thank you all for listening. And Thanks I don't so know. How to, oh yeah. Um, how do I stop sharing my screen? So there should be a red button up at the top. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. So, sure thing. Um, so uh, open it up for some really great questions. <laughs>
So I had a question, Alice, that I don't know if this is a question as much as it's a part comment, <laughs> but uh, a lot of what you're presenting remind, I mean, it's very pertinent today, right? I mean, we see the same kinds of things playing out uh, during the current pandemic. And I'm some of the things that struck me about what you presented, and maybe you can kind of talk more about it, is just, you know, if there is an effort to maybe communicate some of these things to the deaf community, you might see that during like televised announcements from people. But I'm guessing, and, and I think maybe this is something you can speak to, is that there's a real breakdown when it comes to actually engaging those populations uh, on a more one-on-one -on -one level and the, the consequences of maybe neglecting, you know, some of those kinds of uh, more personal interactions. I don't know if that came up in your interviews. Definitely. I think that there is definitely a lack of that sort of on the ground work, um, working with deaf communities. Um, I feel like I've definitely seen a huge increase in televised um, speeches and everything being uh, translated, which is interesting, but you're right. Um, there's just not 100% chance that someone is going to be watching, especially if it's a news channel that doesn't usually have anything that's translated or maybe doesn't have accurate um, captions. And so I think that on the ground work is very important. And um, the deaf community is one that is just not, I mean, at least in my research and what I have learned, it is not one that um, attracts a lot of attention from um, activists or nonprofits or even research. So, any additional questions? So, Alice, I guess um, maybe this overlaps a bit with with Jason's overall question, but. Um, certainly issues of major public health crisis um, are of incredibly importance to get information out to the deaf community. See it in the Flint water crisis, you see it now with the current pandemic situation. Um, but beyond sort of, and, and so at least it's with some governors, we, actually, we do see some sign language interpretation but beyond sort of a public health emergency situation, what are you know, some of the things in your work that you think are, are more broad, um, sort of beyond the public health sort of crisis piece where you might see interpreters and that sort of thing and people being more sensitive? What are some of the more even broader contexts um, that society might need to be thinking about um, as far as inclusivity of the deaf community? Definitely. Um, in uh, any case where a deaf person is being pulled over by the police, there have been instances of deaf people being um, killed because they have to talk with their hands and they're not able to do that. Um, anything in criminal justice in um, courts, there's always interpreters provided, but um, there, I think, definitely could be more attention put onto that because that is very sensitive material that's being translated. And the same goes for within healthcare in general. Um, in hospitals, when working with a doctor, um, you are, you need an interpreter there, um, just assuming that your doctor is hearing, just you can assume that. Um, and so I think things like that, where it's very sensitive material um, and it's very technical term, like terminology. Um, deaf people really have struggled with that in the past, just through a lack of, again, being included in that conversation. Um, yeah. No, oh, thanks for that. And thank you for a great presentation. I'll call everyone's uh, attention to uh, a comment that uh, Natasha Abner made in the chat box about um, the pandemic specifically and the, the deaf community. Um, but thank you, Alice, um, for your great uh, work on this and congratulations. Thank you. And so we will be 